I'm going to look at a few of the things around Nightcaps DA, their refusal and the arguments that they would put forward to say that what they want to achieve is legal. And uh, what we're looking at here is Nightcap and all those furry looking things. It actually looks like a big furry caterpillar of sorts, doesn't it? Uh, what are they? Well, that's 125 streetlights and it took a lot to squash them in <laughs> to get them where they would logically be over 26 and a half kilometres of dirt road. And the cost that was added in the second revision of the costings for the DA, adding in 1.875 million of previously unidentified costings. Now, this is only one of the many things that I've analysed in the difference of the costing. As the council and the state environmental, uh, the Northern Regional Planning Panel, were not going to deal with the issue of the costing, even though they could, and that's simply because there are just so many other issues. Why argue over the costing when there's all these other obvious problems that it doesn't matter what the cost is, they can't get approval. So the elements of contradiction, confusion and everything like that that were in the first costing, not in the second costing. I mean the first costing, very few of those elements are left in the second costing. It's almost like when they put the DA forward the first time that they didn't have a clue what they were costing. And with this second one, it looks like they've gone to someone and said, can you put in these costing elements, bump it up as much as you can. And um, it's been actually interesting analysing those elements. And it's not until you actually look at the details that you start asking some other more obvious questions. But before I get on to those ones, imagine this is supposed to be a dark silhouetted sky, you know, dark mountain silhouette with all the stars in the sky. But now you've got all these 125 street lights lighting up and creating haze. Now, one of the problems when you've got any kind of lighting in any kind of cloud or fog or anything like that, it always makes the light more reflective, more amplified. So where you might have a little bit of a light haze on a clear night, on a cloudy night, that light haze is going to get much bigger, simply because it's got clouds to bounce around in and light up. So would that be a problem for a mountain that when translated into English means cloud catcher? So imagine that all these are lit up under a cloud. Uh, it might even be in winter time when all of these have got fireplaces going too. But it's not just these street lights. There's 392 houses as well that would drown out pretty much what the street lights are doing. And these yellow ones are existing power supplies. This yellow one here in the centre of all the property, there is power that goes all the way through there. So it would have been possible to actually create certain elements of a community where it did provide electricity. But um, that's not 
on the list to be included. So each one of those little light bulbs is only one light bulb on in each of those 392 houses. Chances are there's going to be a lot more than just one light bulb on. So over night time, imagine that you might be taking a scenic drive and looking from anywhere around the area at the scenic view. And this is what you're getting over here. Right now, it's actually dark, but if it was built, you'd have a very obvious light haze and it, it would be very well lit up, especially with the amount of cloud that would hang around because, well, it's not called cloud catcher for, a re for no reason, is it? It's because there's lots of clouds around there. So let's, while we're on the street lighting, let's get rid of the houses and go back to the street lighting. Now, because there is no electricity, each one of these street lights, these 125 street lights, that's worth 15,000 each. It's worth that because they have to be solar paneled. All of these a solar panel. So, you know, I mean, when you think about it, the long-term effectiveness of all of these being lit up at once because the cloud has not been covering them and they've been able to get solar radiation to charge up with, so you would find it very problematic. And you would find it problematic simply because all of these roads and all the allotted dwelling lots are on mountaintops, ridge lines. They are not in the, the valleys or the gullies, they are on the mountaintops. So what you are going to get is cloud. You're going to have a lot of issues too, especially if you've got cloud cover and there's 392 wood fires going. I would certainly hope that no one in the area would be asthmatic or allergic or sensitive in any way because that is going to cause a lot of health issues. All right, so I'm now just going to bring up a couple of other things before I dive in a little bit deeper was showing you how this is comparing is that there was 5.4 million for two bridges that had never been previously costed and that's only two out of the three bridges the one on Mandalay Road is not going to be touched even though Dolph Cook has been using it with all his construction vehicles and everything and everybody all the traffic that goes up and down there every day has trashed the road, but nobody's looking to repair the damage that's been done there, only with what's going on that others can benefit from. So these two bridges here would relate to uh, the Kyogle, um, sorry, the 3222 Kyogle Road entrance, and the one down here at what is called Panorama. Well, I think that's what people call it anyway. So there's your two bridges there, 5.4 million that previously wasn't on the first costing, but is now on the second one at 2.73 each, total of 5.4. Now, an interesting thing is that even though it was stated in the DA that there was 750 metres of sealed road. It was never actually costed anywhere, but it was costed in the second version. And in the second version, oh, I didn't put it in there, sorry. Must have put it in this other one. Because the cost of the sealed roads is strangely enough the same amount as what they've reduced the cost of the unsealed roads by. So let's have a look at the unsealed roads. 
the cost has been reduced by 5.4 million. So it was originally put forward in the DA in January as 26.5 kilometres of unsealed road at a cost of 18.5, excluding GST. The cost of the road is 700,000 per kilometre. So then you go down and you look at their revised costing for 26.5 kilometres of unsealed road at a cost of, what, 13 million? Well, it's cheaper. So was the first price wrong or did you get a discount for some reason? I mean, most of the other prices look like they've gone up. We'll get into those shortly, but this one has gone down. It's gone down by 5.4 million. Oh, sorry, I said it was related to the cost of the sealed roads. It's actually related to the cost of the bridges. So the cost that they took out of the unsealed roads was put across to cover the cost of the bridges. So is that a coincidence oh, that it's it just happens to be the same dollar value as what they suddenly realised. Oh, look, the 28 kilometres of sealed road that we promised in 2020 that was going to cost 28 million went down to 26 and a half kilometres of unsealed road at 18 and a half million. And now they're saying they can do it for just over 13 million. If you ask them again, how would the story change? And the thing being is that as I looked at the costings in these things, it, I actually asked the question, is this just a figure that someone is making up or is this actually based on quotes, on actual costings and estimates that are done because you have looked at the cost of these things and you have got quoted prices. And you have also got a time frame in which those quoted prices are applicable. So you know you can't change a quoted price. If it's valid for a month or six months or a year, that's the price that's valid. So it started me to asking whether there was any normal uh, tendering and quoting process that was going on to see where the best pricings were. And if there was, um, well, they were very lucky to come across being able to do unsealed roads at 5.4 million less. It just seems like they're very lucky because it doesn't matter what they promise. The 28 kilometres of sealed roads was adequate as far as safety is concerned. 26 and a half kilometres of unsealed roads, given that there would be so many people travelling over them a day, my question would be not if people are going to get killed on there, is how many people will be. It will kill people, no doubt about it coming down a hill, an animal might come out, or you try and swerve to avoid it. Heavy weather, I mean, there is any number of scenarios. That's why they're called accidents, because you can't account or prevent them. Well, as actually, you can minimise the risk. As was said last year about sealed roads, it should be mandatory that such a traffic load in those mountainous, dangerous mountainous conditions have sealed roads. Now there's a curious thing too that when it comes to the construction sheds and site office. Now it was made clear that in the DA they are seeking approval for the concept of the development 
and Stage 1 Roadworks. Now Stage 1 Roadworks inc includes clearing of vegetation, uh, doing the roads and site construction office and storage area. So where is the costing for the site construction office and storage area? And is there any plans that would go to those constructions? Or am I not reading this correctly when they say that the vegetation removal is so that where they want to put in the site construction office and storage area, that they can clear that there? It's a little bit indeterminate as to it's always been alluded to that they're putting in the roads and the site office. So where is the costing for the site office? As I said, maybe, it, well, not maybe, everything about this DA is questionable. Now, just before I continue on the cost comparisons, I'm going to um, show you what uh, well Planet put in the statement of environmental effects to the effect that Bulla Bulla and Nightcap are synonymous with the same thing. Now you get here, it's on the very first page of the executive summary where in the introduction about the 21 lots commonly referred to as nightcap and bulla bulla. Now there's nothing in there to say that it's being called bulla bulla by mistake. It's not really bulla bulla um, because nightcap and bulla bulla have nothing to do with one another. Isn't that the narrative that we've been hearing for years? Isn't that why you sue Gillian Norman? Because Nightcap and Bulla Bulla aren't the same? Well, someone ought to tell your town planner that Nightcap and Bulla Bulla aren't the same thing. It's in the very first paragraph of the executive summary. Your own town planner cannot distinguish the difference between Nightcap and Bulla Bulla because, like everybody else, there is none, is there, except a change in name. <laughs> wow, duh. He could have also put in there Mount Warning Eco Village, Nightcap on Minjimble with B-A-L instead of B-U-L, but no. What it is commonly referred to as nightcap and bulla bulla. So if you're talking about bulla bulla, nightcap, same difference. They're synonymous with each other, as confirmed by their own town planner. He cannot make a distinction between the two. So I'm going to go through the costings here and it's not in any particular order it's just how it ended up how I put them on the list some things were a lot easier to try and find out what was going on and others well it's still a little bit iffy because the first costing was not very detailed and there was certainly not as many costed elements in there as what they added in so let's have a look at the differences between the first costing and the second costing. Now the first one here is the telecommunications. The, they increased the cost per unit by $5. So each one of these, 70 went to 75, 30 to 35. So they marginally upped everything there. Previously not included was 125 streetlights at 15,000 each, 1.8 million. Also previously not included 
are the allowances for bridged creek crossings, 5.460 million. And as I said, that cost difference between the roads, uh, the unsealed roads, how they drop the price on that, it is almost to the exact dollar value as 5.46 million. It's, you can see they've taken it off the roads to cover the cost of the bridges. So then they've decreased that cost per metre of the unsealed roads. As you can see, it went from 700 uh, per metre down to 495. So the cost decreased by $205, which is nearly a 30% decrease in the original quoted price. And as I said, that difference is virtually identical to that dollar value for the bridges. So where they took it off here, they put it on here. As they say in the boxes, robbing, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So then we go down further. There's also the sealed strips that were not costed in previous uh, in the previous costing, even though they were mentioned that there was going to be 750 meters of it. Now there's only 500 meters at a cost of 750 per meter. So that cost has been added in. Then these other ones, which I actually found very interesting, that what the allowance for cut to fill for roadworks, wouldn't that already be included in your grading of roads? Uh, 1.6 million. Um, when you say provisional, what's provisional mean? Does that mean you may not spend it? You just put it in there because you may not do it? Like with the street lights and with the road signs? 150 road signs at $450 each. 67500 worth of road signs. Probably most of those are to, you know, slippery when wet, steep slope, sharp angles, watch out for wildlife, you know, beware of accidents. You know those ones where they show animals flipping a car up because you've hit them? Yeah, probably need plenty of them. And I don't know what an EO allowance for cul-de-sac sack slash turnaround is. It's never been brought up before. I don't even know where they'd be sticking it in. Is it at the beginning of uh, 3222? I don't know. Or is it in one of the communities up there that looks like, well, it might have a little bit of a cul-de-sac in the end that you could turn it into? Don't know. Hasn't been specified. As for uh, guardrails, um, rock uh, retaining walls, and allowance for protection to a verge slash grass seeding, blah, blah, none of that had been included previously. And... Well, if it had been an anticipated cost and something that they had quoted to get done, why wasn't it in the original costings? So when it comes down to some things, I just cannot make head nor tail of them. This here can't be compared to anything because it could be tied up in some of this over here although it probably isn't. So they might actually be additional costs to these ones over here, but these ones over here haven't been identified as anything that I can say, well, it's the same price or anything. The only thing I can see that has changed, and this is, this is really interesting after you get to um, change and add in things that you never even had in there in the first place and you come up with a total of 27.982 million so that's what they say that all of these things would cost 
But then they say, well, hang on. What we want to do is they've also increased the contingency. Instead of 15% contingency, it's gone up to 15.1. But before they add that 15.1 contingency, what they're now going to do is add um, well, percentage contingencies that are applicable to some of these elements up here. So 1.5, another 420,000. Uh, 175,000 and 2.4 million, as opposed to, well, it wasn't even in the millions over here. So now they've put in this marginal contingency for the anticipated costs of these expenses, which clearly they haven't got a quote on and don't actually know how much is actually going to cost. So that then bumps the cost up to 31 million. So then on that 31 million, they're going to add their 15.1 contingency on it, which is 4.6 million. Then they're going to add in some offsets, 200,000 for cultural heritage monitoring, 300,000 offset allowance, 150,000 biodiversity protection and whoa, whopping three and a half million in professional fees allowance. So that is what makes up the costing of 39.8. It's taken the basic original costing virtually created a whole new one as if they didn't have a clue when they presented the first one. So it would then lead you to wonder, have they actually even costed anything up in this instance? Do they have quotes? Or are they just going, well, you know what, it's only just like AB would say, you know, triple it, quadruple it, double it, you know, smoke and mirrors. They're all just figures on paper it's meant to look good so it doesn't matter you know we're only going to spend what we're going to spend and nobody will know any different <laughs> so yeah just put in what we want so are there actually any quotes in existence that any of this costing is worked off because if it comes purely from guesswork I'd say you need to do it a little bit better you need to refine your guesswork. So the next thing I'm actually going to look at is the statement that's actually been made by Derek Zillman. His quote was, in many ways the courts could be seen as a preferable pathway for a range of reasons. It is interesting to note that the original DA secured by PVL, Peter Van Leishout, for the original village DA was approved via the Land and Environment Court. Now, at first glance, that might seem, well, yes, so PVL got his approval with the Land and Environment Court, so of course, yes, you can go in there and get it too, because... PVL got it, why can't you? Well, let's just take a look at a couple of the differences on why it's not the same for you as it is PVL. So on his DA 06-1054, that was approved in the Land and Environment Court. The differences to DA 21-0010 at Nightcap or Mingeable. This list will state that PVL's DA was that Nightcap's isn't. So the list is what PVL was that Nightcap isn't. All right. So they think that they will achieve success through the Land and Environment Court because they're in the same condition as what Peter Van Leishout was 
when he went there. But that's completely wrong. For a start, let's take a look at the most obvious thing. It was actually a single lot. But I won't get ahead of the list. I'll just go down the list. And these were things that just came off the top of my head. Uh, because I didn't have to think too deeply about the differences. For start, the uh, D PVL's DA was compliant with the relevant legislation, was not in multiple breaches of mandated conditions, was a single lot, was not seeking to perform prohibited subdivision, was largely on cleared land and did not seek to remove or destroy vegetation. And due to that large cleared area, bushfire requirements were easier to fulfill. And even with that being easier to fulfill, we still had to have a firehouse and truck that was to be permanently housed and maintained. Was not seeking to destroy heritage sites was not seeking to build over a wildlife corridor, was not seeking to destroy flora and habitat for wildlife, was not seeking to deforest and recreate large cleared areas, not seeking to exceed the density cap, was creating multiple business and job opportunities, was much smaller units, flats for accommodation confined to a smaller area, was not seeking to put in 125 street lights and pollute the country, was not creating massive offsets due to environmental damage, was building on land owned and paid for by the developer. And I think that's a very important point. Peter Van Lyshout owns that land. He wasn't trying to buy it off anyone. He wasn't paying it off. He owned it outright. So clear title of land ownership also. Was also providing on-site sewerage treatment plant for all lots usage. Was providing water and electricity was considering water catchment and stormwater, had designated garden beds for grey water, and also too, that the grey waters, the um, toilets, could only use recycled water to flush in them. They couldn't use good potable water. This was all designed in this DA. And also, no pets. Forgot to mention that one, no pets, no hoofed animals. So forget your dogs and cats and forget your cattle and all your goats and all these other things. Uh-uh, no pets and no hoofed animals. And that was on an area that has already been cleared, fairly well grazed on, I dare say, in the past, and it's already compacted, so it's not going to do that much more damage. So he still wasn't allowed with that. I don't know how that conflicts with the fact that cattle are grazed on the larger property. Maybe over a, a wider range it's not so damaging. But they, they do compact the soil, they damage it. And if there's no way to aerate, uh, all it does is it ends up turning it into concrete virtually. So it was not affecting any ma major water catchment in the Birrell Creek side. Now, I've got the water catchment of the Beryl Creek side noted here. As you can see, quite a few houses are right on those water catchment areas. They're grey areas. Grey water is going to go straight into that. But um, it doesn't include the water catchment that actually runs off down here into the Tweed River, which is there, but I don't have a map for it. So in that sense, it's not affecting any major water catchment or there is no water catchment on the Beryl Creek side that this single lot could affect. Again, these are all things that Peter Van Lyshout was um, on his, with his DA, 
that is different, different scenario to what Nightcap proposed. So going down and finishing the list off. Right, so not lodged, was not lodged with the Tweedshire Council at a time when such things were prohibited under the LEP, which the approval that Peter Van Leishout got was quite a few years ago now, and it was not under the current version of the local environmental plan. So what was then not in existence and in full swing is most definitely now in existence and in full swing. He had also not lodged at a time when the Tweedshire Council prohibit rural land sharing communities and were not removing their applicability under the state environmental planning policy. So in other words, it's only a matter of, well, it may have even occurred by now, who knows? They may have been removed. They, the Tweedshire Council, could have already been removed from the state environmental planning policy. So there is no way forward for any rural land sharing community in the Tweedshire at all. Full stop. You want a rural land sharing community, you're going to have to go to another shire. One that still allows it or one that is still covered by the set. So um, they, um, Peter Van Leishout did not lodge his DA when there was the potential for any further DAs under the SEP that would be prohibited. So if the Tweedshire Council removed themselves from the SEP, the, any future DAs to complete what they would want to start could not be submitted. I dare say they'd go, oh, well, we were going to apply for an exemption that because we got in at the beginning of it, we can have it and we can do it. Well, I don't think so. We'll wait and see what the Land Environment Court says. And one thing that Peter Van Leishout did too, that Nightcap didn't do, was he actually had an open day on the proposal for the general public, the locals, to attend and offer their feedback on. There has never been any opportunity for any of the locals, in fact, quite the opposite. Nightcap will not tell people what's going on. They have fought tooth and nail to be the vaguest about everything. And after hearing their arguments on what they're pinning all this faith on that, oh look, there's all these illegal things that we want to do, but we've found this one guy that's got this other guy's opinion that they can argue that those illegal things aren't illegal. That they would have you look at NICAP. Let's have a look at this. As the land one piece of land, the single lot. They want you to look at it as a single lot so that they can be under the SEP, which only allows for a single lot. So, all right, so you've picked you want to be a single lot. So you cannot exceed the maximum of 80 dwellings. Now, this is where it gets into really big stupidity. So all right, we've accepted that you want it classified as a single lot, even though it's actually 21 lots and it's multiple. Well, let's say for argument's sake, it is just this single lot. And that's the way we'll look at it as the land. We'll ignore the boundaries. It's one single lot. Okay, fine. So now let's look at this issue where you want to build 392 houses that far exceeds the 80 density cap. Oh, so now we're just going to push that to the side of why we wanted you to look at it as a single lot. Now we're going to say to you, we want you to look at them as multiple lots 
within that single lot. And each one of those lots fulfills the density that you could have if you just put in one application for that lot. So even though we, we want you to look at it as a single lot, and it is the land, just a single lot with lots of title boundaries on it, even though it's, a, it's not in the spirit of the SEP. But now over here where we want to build on it and get as much out of it as we can, we're going to say, no, now it's multiple lots. Then you say, well, yeah, okay, so you've got your contradiction there. So you've got all these 21 lots that make up the single lot that you want people to look at it in that respect so you can fulfil the single lot. And then over here, to fulfil the density, you want us to look at those same lots as multiple lots. But you don't want us to look at the 21 lots. You want us to look at the 10 lots that you would create after you've subdivided. But even though the subdivision is prohibited also under the SEP, you're going to say that it's not actually subdivision because it's all going to be owned by the same people and nothing's going to change. But it's like, well, if that's the case, why do you even need to subdivide it then? Because how they want to subdivide it is just the weirdest. I mean, the cost of subdividing, you know, they think that, um, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's not really going to change, you know, nothing, we're not actually going to subdivide it. Well, actually, to take your 21 lots and get your 11, well, your 10 for your community and one for the village, you do. You have to survey the whole land mark out the, the title boundaries and change it on the registered plans. And that is subdivision. But, but no, it's not subdivision because the same people will own it. And well, we would have put forward individual DAs for all of them, but it's kind of pointless because it'll all be managed by the same people. So we just thought that, you know, if we did this, put it all together, and you would understand that even though it's 21 multiple lots that we can't subdivide to get even the 11 lots that are still multiple lots, we want you to look at it as a single lot. Ugh. And they're more worried about trying to argue over whether they can have the concept approved that, oh, Andrew Goff spent so much time pointing out that their barrister had this expert information and he won this case too. So, you know, he won it. He's got to be right, this guy. But all this expert information and he's going to tell you that, well, like he did the planning panel, that if you accept his interpretation, you don't have to worry about the laws and what might come if you approve this concept. A half-baked, ill-thought-out concept that you could not trust the concept because the actual physical costing for the stage one construction was all over the place. The first version was like, um, what, is that your first year um, high school student learning maths in accounting and doesn't know what they're doing? You know, let's just make up the figures and put them in there. It all sounds good, looks good, yeah. Do you know what you're actually costing? No, nah, it doesn't matter, looks good. Hey, we've got a nice dollar value on there. We'll, go, we'll make it to the Northern Regional Planning. Good job. Oh, then they get pulled up on it. It's like, oh, hang on. It looks like we might have to get someone make up a better version. So they did. Instead of half a page of rubbish, we got pages more of rubbish. It was a little bit more detailed. But it was also interesting to see how they would change the figures, how they would take off the roads to pay for the bridges. Very interesting. 
actually you know that probably one of the biggest and most in need service for nightcap is a psychiatrist <laughs> someone that can actually talk sense to break through the illusions, the delusions of grandeur, the inability to face reality, <laughs> all of these mental health issues that clearly the developers of Nightcap are struggling with because they are so deluded to think that all of these illegal components, like, let's just have a look at the corridor, the wildlife corridor. Now, I don't know if anyone else was like me, and maybe you were, it's very confusing because they are so vague with all their information. And hey, we weren't the only one. Most people said lack of information, no details on everything. But it was only at the, the planning meeting where it finally got that then this current, the green bit, is the current wildlife corridor. They're not planning to relocate the corridor over here. They're saying that this currently well used and known wildlife corridor is in the wrong place. And in their expert opinion, this spot over here is better suited. So when they say they're not building over a wildlife corridor, that's because in their opinion, this accepted one is incorrect and this is the correct one. So they're not intending to move the wildlife corridor. They're just saying this one's wrong. This is where we think it should be. Now, I don't know how anyone could actually say that this wide strip that is available to water sources provides a lot of tree and shelter and habitat diversity why this is just nah that's that's not the good choice for animals the best choice is to go over here in this short little strip over here that's right on the verge of where they don't like to be in open spaces or around people or you know uh, animals, other animals, uh, farm animals, dogs, all that sort of stuff. So clearly the person that came up with this idea of, well, how do we get away with, we, do, we want to build on a wildlife corridor. Well, who said that the corridor was in the right place? We'll just challenge it and say it's in the wrong place and we'll whack it over here. That's all. <laughs> so they're not moving the animals, they're not relocating them. And this one that they would put them over this very busy access road, yeah, I mean, you can see that you've got a real genius that's come up with this. A real genius that's obviously been surrounded by buildings and concrete his whole life and has never met an animal and wouldn't have a clue what animals are like. Now, there was a few other things that I wanted to talk about, but it's um, got a bit long and uh, I think I might leave it at that. 